How to pray like an Indo-European. Things have changed a lot since the Irish first converted about 1500 years ago and then the English another 200 years after that and then the Scandinavians about a thousand years ago. Much changed in between those times and of course paganism changes in each place it exists over time and now it's being revived in different ways and in, people are practicing in different ways now from they did perhaps 20, 40 years ago. So change is something that has always happened. However, that isn't an argument for total innovation in the field of ritual and practice. Modern paganism involves a balance between historical reconstructionism and innovation. If you're practicing paganism, it means that in some way you want to honor tradition. You can't honor tradition with total innovation. But tradition doesn't mean the worship of ashes, it is the preservation of fire, as the saying goes. So what is essential in the rite and the ritual, what that is, symbolizes the essential metaphysical truth? That is what must be preserved and which cannot be subject to innovative changes. So of course, when I describe how I pray and how I, I do offerings, you'll notice that they, that will differ from how other people do things. But um, and you may do things differently as well, but what you must always keep in mind is what is essential to the Indo-European traditions. Now I focus mainly on Germanic practices, but with an influence from other areas also. Once you establish a system of rites, you should keep it the same, because rigidity is good. The whole point of rites is that you do things the same way over and over. That's what prevents corruption of the tradition, that's what makes it a tradition. So. If we're looking at what's fundamental to Indo-European tradition, I'd say that the gift cycle is very important to understand. We see this in many Indo-European myths, and also in, it's evident in the, what we know about their ritual, uh, rituals as well. That is, you give and you receive in return. You receive a gift from the god, the gods, and you give gifts to them. Sacrifice is the form of giving, and providence is a form of receiving. Another thing to understand that is different from Indo-European tradition from what you may be familiar from Abrahamic traditions etc is that there isn't really a great distinction between prayer and sacrifice because a prayer is to ask for something basically. Um, I mean the old English for prayer is bidde uh, and that is like bid to tell someone or to ask for something or tell someone to do something. So you and in Indo-European pagan religions, you don't get anything if you don't give something first. So it's essentially a form of exchange. The first thing to remember is that your prayer will have to involve an offering of some sort. Another thing to remember, I want, to, I want this to be clear, that kneeling is absolutely normal in Indo-European traditions. In fact, there isn't probably a religion in history that doesn't involve some form of prostration. Maybe you don't go all the way down on the ground like, like Buddhists do, Buddhist pilgrims lie with their face on the ground and some Christians do that. But essentially they all have some kind of physical movement which indicates subordination to the deity you're invoking. In the Homeric literature we read about how they would kneel down or at least raise their palms to the sun as they pray there has to be some gesture of submission. Don't think that this is a purely Abrahamic thing because it's not. I don't know where this myth came from that Indo-European pagans didn't kneel. If you want an example of Germanic people, 
uh, doing this sort of thing? Well, here you can see this is a statue of the Romans of a Fuebian man, clearly in a submissive gesture, kneeling in prayer. You must remember that the words for Germanic gods often meant lords, and they referred to as rulers and kings. And you would certainly kneel before your superiors who were human. So why on earth you wouldn't do the same thing to a high divinity is beyond me. And if you want some literary sources to prove that they were, that kneeling was normal and Germanic people towards their gods, in Pharaohing a saga, that's the saga of the Pharaohese, you have Sigmund de Bretisson and the famous pagan hero Earl Harkon, about whom I wrote an essay. They enter a heathen temple and uh, the following happens. I'll just read from the saga. They go into the temple, Harkon, Sigmund, and a few men with them. There were many gods inside, many glass windows in this house, and not a shadow anywhere. A female figure was in the house over at the far side, splendidly clothed. The earl threw himself at her feet and lay for a long while. Then he stood up and said to Sigmund that they must offer her some offering and lay the silver for it in the form in front of her. And, as a sign that she accepts this offering, I want her to let go of the gold ring that is on her arm. Clearly, there's an offering of exchange. He's giving silver to the goddess. In this case, it was uh, Torgather. And then he will receive in exchange this gold ring, which he needed to use for something else in the saga. Uh, if you read the saga, you can learn all about that. But, you know, th throwing himself at her feet is apparently a normal thing to do towards a goddess in a temple. And of course, sounds just like how, what we read about Roman people doing this kind of thing. So, of course, this is the normal thing to do. So, when your prayers, be prepared to kneel as you would in any other religion. Hindus kneel, Shinto, Shintoists kneel, everyone kneels. So, what do the prayers sound like? Well, we have examples in the European prayers. There aren't very many Germanic ones, but there is one pretty good one from uh, Poetic, Poetic Edda in uh, Sigdrifamal, or when the Valkyrie uh, Sigdrifa, after being awoken by the hero Sigurd, says a prayer for the both of them. And it goes as follows. Hail the day and the sons of day. Hail night and her sister. With kind eyes look upon us here and bring us victory. Hail the gods, hail the goddesses, hail the fertile earth. Give us eloquence and wisdom and healing hands while we live. Now there's a form to that which we find is familiar from other Indo-European religions. Before I explain that format, let me read an, uh, a prayer to Pallas Athene from Homeric literature. I begin to sing of Pallas Athene, defender of cities, awesome goddess, she and Ares care for deeds of war, cities being sacked and cries of battle, and she protects an army going to war and returning. Hail, O goddess, and grant me good fortune and happiness. Do you see the similarity between those two? All the pagan prayers in Homeric literature and sagas and even later charms, which are from Christian times, but contain pagan elements, such as the Merseburg charm from Germany, which does invoke Odin um, or Wotan and Baldr. They have this format, which is essentially tripartite. It works in three parts. The first thing, the god is invoked. They invoke the god with formal address, usually relating to mythological qualities. What is known about the god from the myths about that god? use epithets or kennings in the Germanic examples to, to invoke them, like Thor, the giant killer, or something like that. Odin, you would say, you would use one of his names, like Jan Grimmer, the Iron Mask. Uh, and, and you choose which epithets and which kennings to address the god by in that prayer according to what you are going to ask of them. The second part of the prayer mentions qualities of the deity which pertain to their ability or their inclination to answer that prayer. And you have to give, in this part of the prayer, you will give reasons 
such as what offerings you're going to give to them or what promises of offerings you intend to give after they have fulfilled what you request of them. So, for example, you can say that if you're praying for victory in battle, you might invoke a battle god and say, because you are Pallas Athena, you are a giver of victory. Therefore, that's why uh, we will, will ask you for victory in the final part, the third part of the, of the prayer is the request you're going to make. So before making the request, bring us victory or whatever it is, bring us prosperity. First, you explain why this deity is the correct deity to invoke for that request. And also you say, we, will, we who honour you, we who have made these sacrifices to you in the past, or we who, with your blessings, will make this huge sacrifice in your honour in return for this that you give us. So always remember these three elements for any pagan prayer. That's how they have to be. That's how every pagan prayer, really. There are variations from culture to culture, but essentially they all fulfill this format. Now, for the, the next part is offerings. Of course, time and space play a huge part in what is offered. The most important pagan ceremonies, pagan rituals, are those which happen at liminal times of year such as the midsummer, the midwinter, or other kinds of festivals, which I talked about in other videos, such as the Halloween one, if you want to go and check that out. And another uh, important element is space. So there are some spaces and areas that are more important than others. Sacred spaces exist in all religions. With Indo-European paganism, burial mounds are very important. In Celtic religion, the Shi the she, which is the other world people, their name literally comes from the people of the barrow. And Germanic literature, all other uh, pagan religions, we see that there is a importance attached to places where great men were buried. Also, we have things like sacred trees, which usually can represent a deity. You can see my video on sacred trees for more on that. The oak tree is very important in the Indo-European religion because it usually is associated with the storm god. Then there are other liminal spaces, usually water spaces, which can connect to either deities or to the dead. The most important water spaces in England are springs and rivers. Between the 4th century in the late Roman times and the 11th century in the early Christian era, or in, in the Christian era in England, in Britain in general, there is a constant evidence of offerings to water spaces. So that means the Celts, the Anglo-Saxons, and then the Vikings all were doing this practice. And it wasn't just because the Anglo-Saxons brought it there, because we know that Anglo-Saxons practiced, Germanic peoples on the continent practiced this anyway, and that the Celts practiced it in Britain before the Anglo-Saxons. And then we know that the Vikings practiced it before they came to Britain. So while it was a practice that was done by every people who came to Britain, it was also practiced by all these people before they came to Britain as well. In Scandinavia, the Norse people also made a lot of offerings to lakes. There's never been any f findings of offerings to lakes in the British Isles. That doesn't necessarily mean they weren't doing it, but uh, it might just mean we need to look harder. But certainly we know that rivers and swamps and springs were much more important in Britain, while as in uh, there appears to be a great association with lakes in Scandinavia. There are some lakes in Britain that are named after deities. Ullswater in the Lake District is named after the Norse god Ull, um, but that means the Vikings named it, so they brought that custom with them. And there's another which is older than that, which is uh, Taismir in Worcestershire. Uh, Worcestershire, it's probably named after Tyr from the Anglo-Saxons, which means it would be uh, an, an older Germanic practice than the Vikings. And it basically means the same thing as Tisur, in uh, Denmark, which means Tjurs Lake. And uh, that was an important area with an uh, entire um, settlement nearby. And that settlement has, they've discovered a cult house there, a proper pagan temple on it. So some things were offered to the lake while others were offered to the gods in the temple. We can tell as well the importance of water places in uh, Norse literature because um, they, the Norse sources associate uh, bogs specifically with uh, deities, female deities. Um, and I mean, Brunner Erd means the, the, the lake of fate. 
and that is the place where the speaker's chair of Odin is said to be situated. So Odin's important throne is right next to a water place. And um, Mimirsbrunner, of course, which is often translated as the well of Mimir, um, might not actually mean a well because Brunner can mean, um, uh, can mean a spring, a natural spring, which makes more sense if you think of like Odin reaching into it. Um, so yeah, I mean, water places are important. And I mean, the Thames has historically been used by all kinds of different pagans to, uh, for offerings. So if you live in Britain, and you wanted to do an offering that I would think that a uh, water place would be a good place. And I'm going to do another video all about the importance of water spaces in paganism. Um, but it should be said that I think that rivers probably have a great association with the, with the world of the dead because they were seen as boundaries between worlds. Uh, I'll go into that in more detail in this other video. However, I realize that not everyone has access to lakes and sacred trees all the time. You may be doing the ritual with a group of people indoors and you may be even doing it at home by yourself. Well, that's okay because um, although the other important sacred place that pagans did use in Rome and Germanic places is temples, pagan temples, uh, we can also see that people had small shrines perhaps at home and small deities that they had at home. So that's quite normal to use a, a shrine at home and I have that as well. Uh, you can see this is one that I have with um, the gods Frey and Thor are decorated with gold leaf and this one is a mixed shrine with gods from the Roman pantheon and the uh, and, and another of Odin throned which was based on a find from Denmark. It's worth noting that the, the Anglo-Saxon word whale can mean an idol or it can mean a sacred tree or a sacred place. So this idea of an idol, if you don't have access to sacred trees, sacred springs or something like that, then having an idol at home is essentially the same function. And I personally don't like to make my own idols. I just use replicas of ones that are historically attested. So all the ones you're seeing here are based on actual finds from Scandinavia or from ancient Greece. So what can you do in offerings during your, after you've done your prayer? I think that we can see a commonality of libation and of fire. These are two elements that need to be a part of your offering. Of course, another thing that was definitely most important in old paganism was blood offerings and animal sacrifice. And of course, most of you aren't going to be doing that for obvious reasons. So if you don't have access to an animal to sacrifice, then you can still do a ritual with just a combination of fire and libations. So in, libations basically work in lieu of blood. You can use alcoholic drinks, milk, or even fresh water. The offerings and the prayers must be directed toward the idol. And the idol is a signifier of the divine force that is being invoked, the divine, the aspect of divinity which is a goddess or god, and that's represented by your idol. Of course, mead is the most popular thing for Germanic pagans because that's what we know that they did use, but they didn't just use mead. We know that they use wine and ale as well. In Southern Europe, wine was more common, and in Northern Europe, it seems mead was more common. And this is basically just down to the fact that what was more available. Paganism is not rigid on these kind of things. If either Roman pagans or Norse pagans had access to champagne or whiskey. They wouldn't have had a problem with giving that as an offering. So it isn't really so important to make that distinction between the type of drink. The point is that it is an, a symbolic offering. And you're, if it's a sacrifice, then what's important also is that it is valuable. So giving a cheap sacrifice is not really worth very much. So how much, how difficult is it for you to acquire this offering? That's important. Um, many religions, from Catholicism to Buddhism to Hinduism, use scented incense. We know that the Romans offered burnt incense for the gods also. We don't know of any Germanic examples of them burning scented incense, but I'm sure they probably burned. If you take in Scandinavia pine sap and you burn it, it, it makes a lovely scent. The point is, 
what is the reason that people burn these things for deities? Because it's making a nice smell. You're trying to make things nice, like create nice smells, nice images, nice things that are given in offering. So I see no reason why you shouldn't do this as well. Fire, as I said, is an important aspect of pagan ritual. Now, if you had a pagan temple, you'd probably have some kind of kadai or like central bonfire. Or if you're doing an outside ritual, you can make a bonfire. But if you're at home or in some um, building in an urban area, you're not going to be able to do that. But the symbol of fire is still important. And fire is a purifying sacred element needs to be involved. This can be achieved with simple candles. And many Hindu temples, for example, you can see they have some kind of candles or oil lamps. And the Romans also burned oil lamps for their gods. And the exact form of clay oil lamps, I have a Roman oil lamp, which I use in, uh, as a votive offering. And these were carried on, used by the Christians. The early Christians in Rome used the exact same form. So many of what things we associate with Christianity have been taken from uh, existing uh, practices in the Roman Empire. An oil lamp is a good way of offering and you can put a scented oil in and then you have it works as a form of incense as well. So how do you pour the libations? People sometimes pour them directly onto the ground which is fine if you're outside. Other people like to throw them onto the fire but you can't do either of those things if you're inside. Well inside a temple or inside um, your own home. We have examples of how this should be done I think from some sources. In ancient Rome they had a bowl called a firely. Uh, these were wide, shallow bowls uh, made from metal or ceramic. This places before the deity and pour your libation of wine or milk or water into the firely. And then one, that's the offering. And then after the offering and the prayer has been made, then you take this and pour it out onto the ground from the bowl. So there must be pouring first into the firely, then from the firely into the ground. But there is an equivalent in the Norse sources too, called chlaut bowls or chlaut bolli, that literally a bowl which is for collecting the blood of the sacrifice. So when they were killing an animal, the, the blood goes not onto the ground but into the bowl as an offering. And then from there, they would just uh, sprinkle the blood onto the deities and onto the congregation and on everything else that was in a part of the, of the ritual. Now, the same uh, concept could apply for what is being used in place of blood, which is an alcoholic libation. Pour the alcohol into the bowl and then sprinkle onto whoever there or whatever. And then you just pour the rest onto the ground outside. Once you've finished with the ritual, you take the bowl away. So the, the offering can be done in the bowl and you're not going to get liquid all over the place. So I think if for any Germanic ritual, there must be a, a chlot bowl a fearly style chlot bowl and there should be sacrificial liquids of value and there should also be some kind of fire even if it's just a candle and this you would um, parade the uh, the liquid around because it says in our so a source from Hark on the, Go uh, the Good on the Yule um, blot which is described in that saga and I've mentioned it in previous videos and it was in inspirational for the cartoon that I recently made with uh, Christopher Steininger that the there was a central fire in the in the hall around which the horns of mead were paraded so if you're a Germanic pagan you're probably going to use a horn as a vessel to contain the liquid so you'll pour the the alcoholic beverage from the horn into the chlort bowl and then but you will first move it around the flame so I can give you, uh, I'll just recount that um, sacrifice for those who aren't familiar with it. Sigurd Hladachjal was a great sacrificer, as his father Harkon had been. He kept up all the sacrificing feasts in Thrandheim on the king's behalf. It was an old custom when a sacrifice was to take place that all the bonders should come to the temple and take with them the provisions needed while the feast lasted. Every man was to bring ale. There was also slaughtered all kinds of small cattle as well as horses. All the blood which came them from was called chlort, sacrificial blood. The vessels for holding it, chlort bowls, and the twigs, chlort twigs, with which the altars had to be reddened all over, and also the walls of the temple inside and outside. 
Then the men were to be sprinkled with them, but the flesh had to be boiled for people to eat. Fires were to burn on the middle of the temple floor and kettles to be put on them. The drinking horns had to be carried around the fire. The chief who made the feast had to consecrate the horns and all the sacrificial food. The horn toast of Odin must be drunk first for the victory and power of the king. And then the horn of Njord and then Frey for a good year and peace. It should be remembered that the sacrifice here described is in a sacred place with gods and a communal area and at a sacred time of year. So it doesn't necessarily reflect a daily ritual that people would do in their homes. But I think we understand the basic elements of it. There must The sacrificial elements are there, the prayers are there, the offerings are there. When I was in Lithuania, I see similar things when I was at the Midsummer celebrations, and I know that they always like to use fire. They have a bonfire. They also put candles onto um, little rafts that they send down the river. So there's also the involvement of water spaces and there's pouring of libations. Uh, similar things happen elsewhere. When I see ancient Roman temples, you can see that there is an altar uh, in there. This is the uh, temple of Athena here with this altar. Another thing about deities is they can be 3D carvings, wooden usually if it's Germanic tradition or marble in, in uh, the classical Roman and Greek, but they can also be relief carvings or they can be 2D paintings. The actual form isn't so important. The point is that it's a representation. Now you have a, quite a good idea of how to practice Indo-European paganism on a daily basis. Um, these are the forms that, that should be taken. You can, of course, have varieties in what kind of liquid you offer, how you, um, what kind of flame you use, what the deity, the form of the deities looks like, whether you use a painting or whether you use a statue. These things don't matter, but what matters is that the, the format remains the same. You have the, the deity or the sacred tree, the, whatever it is, of, which represents the deity. You have the offerings, you have the invocations, which must correspond to traditional invocations, and then you have what you're asking in return. Um, thanks for watching this. I hope you find it useful if you're a pagan and you're learning about practice. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, and also consider becoming a patron on Patreon, or just send me a donation on PayPal. I'll put the links for them all in the description below. Tune in next time for a video on water spaces. Thanks.